Last month, we revisited some cool British singles released in January 1967. Now, it's time to take a look at some great British singles released in February of that year. Here we go. Living is easy with eyes closed. February saw the release of one of the key singles of 1967. The single, which was released as a double A side, had a major impact on the music scene. Record Mirror wrote, One really needs a couple of pages to fully describe Beatles discs these days. Take Strawberry Fields Forever for instance, how do you get across this slightly dirgy depressing rolling oddly backed harmonium pumped atmosphere? It's mostly John with odd vocal bits from Paul. It's advanced, a bit technical but massively compelling. But then, how do you deal properly and briefly with Penny Lane, which is mostly Paul with bits of John? This is perkier with excellent lyrics and poetic quality, with brass, with atmosphere, a trumpet obbligato, and a sturdy beat. Play it, both sides, buy, and then study this well-constructed pop music. Derek Johnson from the New Musical Express wrote, Certainly, the most unusual and way out single the Beatles have yet produced both in lyrical content and scoring. Quite honestly, I don't really know what to make of it. Manfred Mann listened to the single a week before it was released, and reviewed it for Disc Magazine. Manfred Mann wrote, I'm glad I had the opportunity of hearing it more than once. In fact, Klaus Vormann had a copy soon after it was recorded and brought it round for me to hear. The first time I heard Penny Lane, I thought it was fairly pleasant but it left me rather cold. Then, I would find myself waking up in the middle of the night with a tune on my mind and realize it was Penny Lane. It's an excellent record. It has an obvious and more immediate appeal than the other side. At first, Strawberry Field struck me as being manufactured and over clever. I thought that here were four guys trying to show that they were not being left behind. On second hearing, the song seems to hang together a bit more. It's very good, basically a good melody, the way they recorded it is brilliant, everything here is well thought out. Disc Magazine also asked Mickey Dolenz from The Monkees to give his verdict on the single. Dolenz said, Paul McCartney played it to me when I went to his house the other day. Of the two sides, I prefer Strawberry Fields, although Penny Lane will probably be the big seller. As usual, the Beatles have been very progressive. We intend to progress as well, but not in the same way of course. Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits also seemed to prefer Strawberry Fields. Peter Noon said, I think the Beatles should have released just Strawberry Fields and not Penny Lane. It's the better side, at least it shows they are trying. Penny Lane is just a good recording, but Strawberry Fields is fantastic. It's the side Murray the K is playing in New York. The single peaked at number two on the British charts, breaking the band's four-year run of chart-hopping singles in the UK. Release Me by Engelbert Humperdinck kept the single from reaching the top spot in Britain. Another great single released in February 1967 was On a Carousel by The Hollies. The single was recorded in Abbey Road and it was seen as the beginning of a new era for the group. Disc magazine journalist Penny Valentine wrote, Usually, a Hollies record does not hit me the first time round. I have to hear them a lot before I really like them. Not so this. What must definitely class as the best record they've made done in a style which comes closer to the huge round sound of American records than any I've ever heard. An excellent record. The Hollies, who toured the States in early 1967, spoke to the press about how new American bands and artists were starting to influence their style. Guitarist Tony Hicks said, You can't help but be influenced. I would say that we were hit by the Loving Spoonful and the Mamas and the Puppas. In fact, I think that Carousel had something of their sound about it. Personally, I find that I am also influenced by Clapton and Hendrix. I don't play as well as they do, but my sound is similar. Graham Nash said, The Americans are coming much more into the picture. There's a lot of absolute rubbish being recorded and doing well. But the handful of artists and groups who have real ability are definitely influencing the scene. We didn't get to hear any really good new groups when we toured the States, mainly because we were so busy. But I liked what I heard from the left bank, worth watching. The B-side of the single, All the World is Love, was another excellent song featuring some of the best harmonies the Hollies ever recorded.
I guess we'll never know if John Lennon was inspired by the title of this song when he wrote All You Need Is Love four months later. The single reached number four in the UK, and it was also a hit in the States, where it reached number 11 according to Billboard. My Friend Jack by The Smoke was one of the most controversial singles released in February 1967. This was due to the obvious acid references in the lyrics. Just as the song was entering the top 50 in Britain, the BBC decided to ban the record. And it eventually ended up stalling at number 45. The song, however, was a huge hit in Europe. It reached number 2 in Germany and it was also a top 10 hit in France, Switzerland, and Austria. Disc Magazine reported, with a record called My Friend Jack Eats Sugar Lumps, the smoke could have expected some sort of kerfuffle. But the stern rebuke from the news of the world was only the iceberg tip of what went on behind the scenes. It cost EMI £750 and two months to re-record and change the lyrics four times before the doubts about its suitability were assuaged. My friend Jack eats sugar lumps. Oh, what beautiful things he sees. The BBC was reported to have suffered qualms when Simon D played it. Quite a rumpus for four young lads from Yorkshire to kick up in their first few months in London. Guitarist Michael Rowley said, We didn't set out to be deliberately controversial, although I suppose the meaning must be obvious to even someone who's only seen LSD on his checkbook. In fact, we only came to write the song by accident. It was a sticky time for us. Nothing we wrote seemed to go right. To try to cheer the others up, I began to sing this stupid phrase, my friend Jack eats sugar lumps. After a while, nobody could forget the line and so we began building a song around it. Nowadays, John's Children are mostly remembered for being a band that featured future T-Rex leader Mark Bolan on guitar but the group recorded some fine songs in the 60s. This single was recorded five weeks before Bolan joined the band. Disc Magazine reported, The guitarist Jeff McLeckland, after eight months with the group, left just after they made this. They now have singer Mark Bolan with them. Mark feels slightly uncomfortable that he didn't contribute to the record. But apart from that, he's very happy because the responsibility of being a solo singer was beginning to get a bit much. The B-side of the single featured the late great Jeff Beck on lead guitar. The band was never taken very seriously by the press, mostly due to their manager's knack for weird publicity stunts and ridiculous statements. Manager Simon Napier Bell, who also managed the Yardbirds, promoted the band as the first of the anti-lust groups and he told the press that he had discovered the members of the group on a vagrancy charge while he was on holiday in Saint-Tropez. Record Mirror reported, John's children, currently selling well with just what you want on Columbia, are described by their manager Simon Napier-Bell as outrageously arrogant, crippingly honest, and at the same time totally naive. The manager added, they are honest because they aren't sophisticated enough to be devious. They are naive because they look clean young and sweet and this has so far protected them. They are arrogant because they find other people ugly, devious, and boring. The boys have already nibbled at the American charts with their smashed block single. Despite the band's lack of success, their music and attitude had some influence on the British punk scene of the late 70s. Listen to their song Let Me Know, and you'll find it's very reminiscent of a certain song that The Clash recorded in the early 80s. February 1967 also saw the release of Soft Machine's debut single. The band was a central group of the Canterbury scene, and they became one of the most important groups from the UK underground psychedelic movement, sharing the stage with bands like Pink Floyd at the UFO Club and other venues. They were also the first band from that scene to issue a single. This 45 predated Pink Floyd's debut single by a month. The song, which was produced by Chaz Chandler, featured Robert Wyatt on lead vocals, 
and it was one of the most pop-oriented songs the band ever recorded. The B-side, however, produced by Kim Fowley, was more akin to the weirdness and psychedelia that people expected from Soft Machine. Honey, I'm feeling, reeling and squealing for you. Feelin' Reelin' Squealin' featured Kevin Ayers singing lead vocals for the verses and Wyatt singing the chorus. Why don't you tell me one way or another? Despite the band's influence on the underground scene, the single was barely reviewed in the press only managing to get a couple of small reviews in music papers like Record Mirror. Record Mirror wrote, This highly commended first effort just missed a tip. It's very different in every way, with gimmicks, but also sound musicianship. I liked it a lot. Hope you do. The single failed to chart. This single by Graham Bond organization caught everyone off guard when it was originally released in February 1967. This psychedelic single with strong Arabic influences was certainly very different from the sort of material people expected from the band. Graham Bond was one of the first artists to perform rhythm and blues in Britain eventually paving the way for the so-called rhythm and blues boom spearheaded by bands like the Stones and the Yardbirds. The most famous lineup of the band featured Ginger Baker on drums, Jack Bruce on bass, John McLaughlin on guitar, and Dick Hextall Smith on saxophone. By the time this single was recorded, however, Bruce and Baker had already left to form Cream with Clapton. Future Coliseum member Dick Hextall Smith remained in the band and his future companion in Coliseum, drummer John Heisman, replaced Tinja Baker. Journalist Penny Valentine wrote, Someone's gone mad, you got to have love babe, is one of the oddest messiest noises I've ever heard. To learn it was the Graham Bond organization was a shock. Larry Page will never speak to me again. The melody maker gave the single a positive review. Waves of sound bite through like acid from the Graham Bond organization in their finest ever recording. Graham wrote and sings this heavily Eastern-flavored chant, with its drone and stomping relentless beats supplied by brilliant young drummer John Heisman. Dick Hextall Smith wails in the background, and the three are marching to a big hit for the first time. Despite the Melody Maker's hit prediction, the single failed to chart. As a curious note, the song Lease on Love, recorded by the Graham Bond organization in July 1965, was the first British song to feature a Mellotron, at least 18 months before the Beatles made the Mellotron famous with Strawberry Fields Forever. First of all, I tried my baby with Those who watched this channel's recent video about cool British singles from January 1967 may remember the story of how the addicted man by the game was pulled from release by EMI due to its controversial lyrics. Only a few copies of that single made it to the stores before it was pulled from release, so the game released a brand new single a month later. The song sounded about 10 years ahead of its time. It wouldn't be strange to mistake it for a punk single from the late 70s. Record Mirror wrote, very atmospheric, and not to be underrated because of the group's pulling power club-wise. But it's a bit messy though exciting. The Flip is the same song that appeared as the B-side of the Addicted Man single. The single never charted. Yes, now the shield is upon me, you're the fluid girl. I'm in control of your subconscious mind. Episode 6 were formed in London in 1965. The band featured future Deep Purple members Ian Gillan on vocals and Roger Glover on bass. Love Hate Revenge was their fifth single, and the first that saw the band starting to experiment with psychedelic pop sounds. Even though it's usually considered to be one of their most memorable 45s, the press wasn't too enthusiastic about it when it was originally released. Penny Valentine wrote, I'm rather disappointed with Episode 6's latest Love Hate Revenge. It may be one of those things that needs a lot of plays. But on instant hearing, it was disjointed and the tune was hard to follow. Shame, because they're a good group. Just like it happened with all their other singles, Love Hate Revenge never charted in the UK. However, oddly enough, the band enjoyed great success in Beirut, 
where their cover of Morning Dew by Tim Rose, which was released a few months later, topped the charts. The band even toured Lebanon in 1967 with great success. Another excellent single that failed to chart was Wooden Spoon by The Poets. The Poets were formed in Glasgow in the early 60s and they were managed and produced by Stones manager Andrew Holden. The Edwardian look of the band was based on the Scottish poet Robert Burns' appearance in paintings of his time, hence the name of the band. The Poets were widely regarded as one of the most inventive groups in Scotland in the 60s. Between 1964 and 1966, they released three singles on Decca and two on Immediate Records. Despite their popularity in Scotland, Now We're Through was the only single that managed to chart. By the time Wooden Spoon was released in February 1967, the band had undergone several lineup changes, and the single saw the band transitioning to a more psychedelic pop direction. Record Mirror wrote, No real complaints here. It's a wildly successful beat ballad within rather routine limits. Nice danceable sound. Despite the single's commercial failure, Wooden Spoon has become a cult classic among fans of British psychedelia through its appearance on several psych compilations over the years. As evidenced by this video, February 1967 saw many British bands starting to experiment with psychedelia, both musically and lyrically. Supermarket Full of Cans by the Eyes of Blue still retained the soul influenced mod sounds that were popular in British clubs. But it showed the band moving away from conventional lyrics and going for a more absurdist surrealist approach. Certainly, a chorus with those lyrics could only come out of 1967. Record Mirror reported. Here's the group who will shortly be hitting the headlines with their self pen song Supermarket Full of Cans, released on the Derham label this Friday. Fresh up from Wales, these six boys have the right idea about publicity. They intend to promote the theme of their song by performing it in their local store. If the sales go up, the manager of the shop has promised them free groceries. Sounds like a good deal to us. Even though the single failed to chart, the song has become a cult classic among fans of mod sounds from that era. And the tune took a new lease of life during the mod revival of the late 70s, when many DJs spinning in mod clubs rediscovered the song and introduced it to a new generation. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to February 1967. See you next time.